Grass. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we begin this new week, shall we open the word of the Lord, review some of the things that we have studied, and consider other items that we need to understand for this time in Earth's history? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to come again before you. We thank you for the opportunity to assemble, to join together, to learn items that are presented within your word, examples that we need for this time in this earth's history. Direct us now. Help us, Father, because we need to understand. Our minds have been dark. We have not understood all that we should. Be with us now. Bless us, please, with your wisdom, with your direction so that we may come into a closer walk with you and be found to be walking on the path with the light that is set behind so that we may come to an understanding that we may present to others and to show your character and your love to this world that is soon to end. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you, now and always, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we left off this last week toward the end of Judges 3. And there were several points that were going to have to be looked at because there were some considerations of different items that were being presented within this scripture. Now, in Judges 3.19, we have the judge. Coming before us, we're dealing with Ahud, and Ahud, but he, Ahud, himself turned again from the graven images that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, keep silence, and all that stood by him went out from him. So Eglon sends out his servants. Ahud has turned from these graven images that were by Gilgal. Now, these that are being referenced by Gilgal, are they the rocks, the stones that were erected by Joshua? Or would these more properly have been graven images yeah these these would be graven images they wouldn't be what joshua had erected okay so why would the translators then have used the words quarries rather than graven images in this passage i i have no idea why they chose to use that word um doesn't really make much sense to me why they did So is, is Ahud showing that he has turned away from the idolatry that most of Israel at that time had accepted? Well, it's symbolically. I mean, it's just that saying that they, when they came to that area, he turned back right. to go to, to speak to the king. But I guess symbolically, 
um, it would it would represent that. Okay, because we've accepted that what we're finding here in judges right now is messages that are more for our time than they are the literal people to be represented at this time, right? Yeah, well, and yeah, there's a whole bunch of symbolic things here that mean something to us. I mean, this half cubit, the right and left-handed thing, um, the the dagger, right, in, in that it has two edges. Um, also, just the significance that we see by Gilgal. Um, and... And even some of these things like this, the hidden errand, and, and we haven't really even addressed this silence yet, what it might mean. Um, so there's all kinds of symbolism in this story that would relate to, I believe, um, a message that came to this movement um, and, and to sp figure out specifically which message I think is, is part of it. Okay. Can we say that the king is instructing Ahud not to speak in front of his servants? Yes. Yep. That's the idea there. So what would we symbolically see there? Well, what what I see in this 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 message is it's something that's hidden, and um, it's not for everyone's ears. Now, comment in the chat was asking: Could the quarries be as shelves of books we should not have in Seventh Day Adventist colleges, universities? church libraries i'm i'm going to ask it more simply is this the apocrypha no okay why not what you the graven images no oh you're talking about the hidden thing yes well i would say part of it um I think more, I think about the charts though. I wouldn't disagree. Yeah. I but mean, I mean, the Apocrypha has some to do with the charts as well. Right. But I, I would think, you know, God hid his hand over a mistake in the figures. So there's this something that's been hidden and it's, and it's in contrast um, to these graven images as well. Now, uh, just another translation of, of Judges 319 is the Bishop's Bible, which predates the King James. And it says, but he himself turned again from the place of the graven images that was by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto the O king, which said, keep silence and all that stood before him went out from him. So uh, to translate this as quarries, um, I mean, the word can be translated as quarries, but not in this context. And so I just, anyway, it's just another point. But as far as this, um, this secret errand, um, and I mean, the, the question is kind of who does the king represent? I mean, what's really being sim symbolized here? Uh, why, is it, why is this secret errand being given unto the king? The secret message, which is going to cause the death of this king, right? So, so whose death is caused? How do how do we understand all of this symbolically? We have some of these symbols, but to put them all together uh, takes a little bit. So, if we apply the charts in here as the secret thing. We would see, of course, that the charts have been set aside, and then the charts are no longer secret. 
For a while, Ehud kept silence. And then, in order to have this revealed, the king sends his servants out to hear what Ehud has to say. And, and another thing about this, um, just dealing with if this is a message, and it relates to the charts. So we're going to have the charts introduced into this message um, after 9-11. Right. Um, and it's the introduction of the charts that is going to bring about an understanding of the 2520. In the line that we were discussing about when did the charts come back into the movement? Uh, well, we, we sort of study that. I don't know the exact year. I could probably figure this out. Uh, was it about 2003? Yeah, somewhere in there. I think it was uh, 2005. Okay. Well, it was after, it was after the ozone. Anyway, we had, they had that ozone meeting, and Jeff, Jeff didn't bring out charts of that there. So that was in 2004. No, so you're saying when they brought out the charts? is 2000 well, that we see them 2000, well 2005 i think the time when jeff identified the 2520 he was using the charts beforehand to illustrate that paganism was the daily that right there was way, well that was way before so that was in the 1990s okay but as far as, as actually the charts their significance in the movement um, and, and we would look at not just the 1843. Did he have the 1850 chart all originally too? Yes, I think so, because that's what identifies what paganism is. Yeah. The daily. So it's just that one, the charts become prominent once we understand the 2520. That's what you're saying. Yes. So, okay. But yeah, so that's when the charts become, I guess, present truth for this movement. I would think that to be correct. Okay. So then in the line that we're addressing from Judges 2, we would then be placing this portion of Judges 3 at about 2005. Yeah, something like that. So when the 2520 comes in, that's on the chart, on the charts themselves. So is this secret errand this secret thing being revealed representationally that of the 2520 and it's at the 2520 then that causes the death of Eglon mm -hmm. well that's what I see in all the symbolism here it has to do with this chiasm okay which is going to be not fully understood as a chiasm com completely but but at least the idea of it, the two 2520s um, start to partly be understood here. Okay. And Ahud came unto him, and he was sitting in a summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. And Ahud said, I have a message from God unto thee, and he arose out of his seat. So he was sitting, he arose. Those are the king. Right? Yeah. The so king those, so that's Eglon. Mm -hmm. 
And Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. It's kind of interesting to me because as you stand before the charts, the 2520 is displayed on the left side. So in this situation, The, the, the possibility of applying the 2520 as being the dagger that brings the death of Eglon is there. Mm -hmm. And the haft also went in after the blade. And the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly. And the dirt came out. In other words, the intestines, the guts, his internal organs are now out for display. Then Ahud went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them. So Ahud went out from this porch, this summer cooling porch, this place where the king would be cooled during the summer months. And he locks the doors behind him. Yeah, and this is sort of like a colonnade with pillars. Okay. Right. And then he closes the door so we have a shut door. That's the point I was just about to make. It's not only shut, it's also locked. Well, that actually just, I don't know if uh, there's any difference in the Hebrew. But it says, he, and he locked them. Um, just means shut up. It could mean bolt. Um, but yeah, so he locks them. So secures them in some way. So it's, it's, it's a shut door that can't be opened was the idea. Okay. So that would bring us to Revelation uh, and also to uh, Isaiah 22, 22. Now, comment from the chat again. Ahud means united and unity from Strong's. Would this then be a unified message? Well, it is a unified meth message. It doesn't mean the people are unified, but there's something about this message. Yeah, in Isaiah 22, 22, in the key of the house of David, while I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. Okay. So, in this situation, we have Ahud stabbing the king of Moab, locking the door behind him or securing the door behind him after he has delivered a message. When he was gone out, the servants came. And when they saw that, behold, the door of the parlor were locked, 
they said, surely he covereth his feet in his summer chamber. So, in this portion of the example, Ahud has left, Eglon is dead, the servants are confused. What can we make from the servants being confused? They've not received a message. They were sent out. I can barely hear you. Sorry. Please repeat. I was thinking July 18th would be confusion. Okay. The confusion. You hear me now? I hear you now. It came through clear. Okay. I was saying July 18th would be confusion. Now, if we're applying this as, as being occurring about 2005, what other confusions would have come about that time? I mean, as I'm recalling this, there was quite a battle from the corporate church over the validity of Leviticus 25 and 26, the seven times, and over the use of the charts. They were taken by surprise when the charts are all of a sudden becoming present truth because they didn't expect this. How long has um, Wilson been General Conference President now? Since 2010, I was going to reply too long. Okay, so my question is, if we're applying this to 2005, that would have meant that this would have been under the office of Jan Paulson, right? Yeah, Wilson was elected in, uh, let me see here. Yeah, June 23rd, 2010. Paulson was the one before that, Jan Paulson. So does this message coming out at about 2005 become part of the reason why Jan Paulson is not reelected as general conference president? Mm. I mean, we have, we, we have this situation. I mean, we're, we're, we're attempting to do is to place points of this of judges onto a line in a format very similar to what we were addressing from judges too. And we should be able to establish it if this is a proper manner of, of addressing this book. Yeah, so this would be a message that um, 
the initial response here so is is the church right so obviously right. eglon would represent the church um and and initially at that time the movement itself um is still focused on trying to get a message to the church exactly um, so the servants that's the question I have is who do they represent specifically? Would that be people in the movement that are confused regarding the issue with the church? That, the, they, ch that the church doesn't accept the message and that the message ends up closing that door to the church in a sense? I think that could be one way of looking at it. Yeah, because, um, I mean, this has sort of happened progressively in this movement, but when, when I first came into the movement, many of the people who had who had come into the movement, unlike Jeff, Jeff wasn't really interested in trying to go to pastors and conference presidents and things like that to try to talk about the 2520. Um, I mean, it wasn't closed completely to having discussions with people, but he didn't really feel that that's what we were to do. That wasn't, it wasn't his calling. And, and yet many people were still trying to do that. Even in 2010, you know, people would, uh, and, and especially some of the people who had joined over the 2520, they were still thinking that, you know, the church is going to accept this message, which I think Jeff had already understood that wasn't going to happen. So, um, you know, and it's interesting, I mean, because, and I don't think this necessarily just represents 2005. I think it represents probably from 2005 uh, till 2012. I think it represents a period of time, this message. Because that's really what I call the period of the development of the 2520. So it's a period of about seven years. And then what are you going to have happen in 2012. I don't remember 2012 that well. But well, I isn't, see. Isn't 2012 going to be um, the disfellowshipping that happens, or am I getting my years wrong? That's possible. I'd have to look back. That's, that's very that possible. Yeah, so that would be uh, Newport, wasn't that 2012? Good possibility. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just trying to remember exactly. Um, I'd have to go back in a different set of files to look it up. Now we have a we have a hand raised. Okay. Yeah, I I know I bought in a lot, so I was trying to prevent that, but. We're now looking at Eglon as a head of a church instead of a in the, instead of government, and that's what's puzzling me. Like I can see what you're saying fits, but does he like is he su supposed to be a uh, the church head rather than like the president or whoever? Okay, you are you are correct, Theodore. I have the um, a letter that was put out by the Newport Church, the controversy in Newport over the teachings of Jeff Pippinger, and this went out February of two thousand twelve. Yeah, so, so that's the way that I would look at this message. It's that message of the twenty five twenty from the charts, and what what's confusing people i mean the servants would be i think people in this this message still gathered around the church and and don't quite understand what happened does that make sense to people well okay your point there are those that would be would have been studying but there would have been those that also would have just chosen to accept the word of their pastor, the word of the church, 
instead of studying for themselves. Mm -hmm. And I'm having to wonder if the servants aren't representative of those that hear this message, but they, they have heard the word of the church and they've accepted it. Mm -hmm. Rather than investigating this for themselves. So I think your, your point is logical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, because it's a message and it's a message that goes over a period of time. There's seven years in, for, in order for that message to uh, do its work. Um, and then you would have this closed door then is really the door being closed to the church. In, in uh, for the people in this movement who who want to still have the church, and we see this happening even through that period. For instance, um, that paper on Joseph that's on my uh, by uh, Johannes Kaletsky that's on my uh, academia site there. If people want to look at it, but that was published in April of 2010. Now he ended up leaving the movement because of what he perceived as the movement's negative attitude towards the church. I don't know exactly when he left, um, but there was a lot of people because of what happened, because of the church's rejection of the seven times, they didn't feel that they could continue following the movement because they needed, they were following the church. And so these are the servants of Eglon. That's that I think that's logical and it and it agrees with this history and with the symbols that we have here. At that time, I remember having conversations with friends, some of whom wound up attending the general conference session where Wilson was elected president. I have one friend of long standing that believes that Wilson is a holy man of God. And that anything that he has to say, any pronouncement is to be treated as if it would, was from God himself. Now, obviously I don't have that belief at this point i can see where eglon is representative of the church itself that the death of eglon is the passing of the administration from paulson to Wilson. And then when we're looking at this in the following verse, and they tarried till they were ashamed, and behold, he opened not the door of the parlor, therefore they took a key and opened them, and behold, their Lord was fallen down dead on the earth. They tarried. Would 2010 to 2012 be representative of a tarrying time? I don't know of 2010 to 2012, but I would put a tarrying uh, to me in this movement uh, that happens from 2012 on. Well, I'm, not, I'm not saying of the movement, I'm saying of the church before they made their decision to start casting people out. Okay, well, well, the these are the servants, and to me, the servants are the people in this movement who have their attachment to the church. So, at least that's how I've interpreted it. All right. Um, so, if you're saying that this is who's tearing, the church is tearing? I'm saying that the, 
those that were the servants, the let's say that the employees of the church that had not made up their minds or those that were on the fence regarding the message that Jeff had been presenting, whether they were of the church or members of the church, I'm asking if those are the ones that were tarrying at this point. Okay. So I take this key that opens this door yeah. as relating to, Stephen, do you have something to say? Yes, not. It's just your mic was on. Okay, so um, because in 2012, as as we Jeff is going to be presenting Habakkuk's Tables, and and the first one that they published of Habakkuk's Tables was actually on June 22nd, which I find interesting. In, in 2012, though they've taken those down and they reposted them, and I'm not sure why, but but originally when they had posted uh, the presentations, it was. Even though they started earlier, they post them on their YouTube page. But anyway, that's beside the point. So what you have is you have this period of 2012. And to me, 2012 is a type of tearing in the movement that's going on. We're, we're going to be having this, um, uh, the issue that's going to arise in, in causing the separation in the movement. And to some degree, uh, it there are a number of factors that lead to this separation in the movement. That is, there are people who are leaving the movement because um, the, the movement is moving away from the church too much over this issue of the 2520. You also have uh, a group of people who are really strong against the church. They have their own churches, right? Uh, these ministries, such as Path of the Just. And so Jeff is putting out Habakkuk's uh, two tables in 2012, and he's going to complete that in 2013. And in 2013, I believe there is a key that opens this door that's been shut. And I believe that key was um, Ezra 7-9. Right. And Ezra 7-9 opens this and hel helps us to see that this clearly the issue regarding the church that the that egg lawn has fallen down dead on the earth right so because i really believe ezra 7 9 is the key and it's the key that has been unlocking um this whole issue of the 2520 and its relationship to our movement and even presently is a big key in understanding uh july 18th and december 25th and also a 2030 so this key opens these doors but it shows us it shows us that the church isn't going to accept this message. Right. <clears throat> and this is yeah, okay, go on. No. Finish, please. So Ehud escaping while they tarried is this message continuing on and it passes by the quarries. So this message carries us beyond, in this case, these graven images. And, and then we escape onto uh, Seer, but it's in a feminine form, right? Right. So this, this word escaped, as we looked at it before, um, related to, um, uh, what was the word again? Yeah. See, Rob. Yeah, so, so it went from smooth to roughness. Right. So, and that would represent uh, this movement. And, and smooth to roughness, it can mean a number of different things. Because um, escaped is this smooth or slippery, right? Because that's um, 
that word. Uh, let me see here. Um, it's going to see here, make sure that I'm correct on this. Um, Uh, yeah, so it's the same word in Daniel 11, verse 41, right? He shall escape out of his hand. Okay. So that, that word slipperiness or smoothness. So they go from smoothness or slipperiness to roughness. And, and that can refer to, roughness can also refer to the idea of, of difficulty, but also of a prophet. Because they're dressed in a rough garment? Yeah. And then this relationship to Mount Seir is kind of interesting because we never we never really dug into that too much. Um, um, because Seir just has to do with it's called Mount Seir because of the roughness. But it's just here we have a feminine form. And, and, and I suggest that it might be Hebrew idiom that's just translated uh, incorrectly. And that we don't necessarily know what it means to move from smooth to roughness. Um, but this message is is definitely progressing from something that was uh, maybe easier to accept, but has more difficulty uh, associated with it. But are we are we also not told of those that prophesy smooth things? So wouldn't much of the message now be seen as being rough because it's not as easy to take? It's something that cuts to the, you know, cuts to the inside of the person. Yeah. Um. I mean, did Christ ever prophesy smooth things? No. A lot of what he had to say was treated as being very different from what the leaders of the church of his time were having to say. So... Is the movement to be any different from that of Christ? No. Okay, comment from the from the chat, Hebrews eleven thirty two to thirty eight. Why is this important? Why should we consider this right now? Uh, these are the same verses I posted before uh, about all, all, of, all of the sufferings that the prophets have gone through. Any, anybody who's trying to fulfill God's will and is alienated from the world, which would include the church. And also, I don't know if you heard my comments about, about Eglon, because I was puzzling why, although I can see the parallels that you're bringing up, um, why we're looking at him as a church head instead of a state head. Yeah, well, yeah, when we're looking at King Eglon, it's not the church, the, the, the spiritual aspect of the church, but the administrative aspect of the church. Ah, uh, okay. That, that's the way we're looking at it here. And, and we can see that that's really the problem, because we're still Seventh-day Adventists. But well, yes, indeed. But we recognize that the that the organization, the administration, has gone astray, and so so we're not following their rules that they have created. But we still we still are Seventh Day Adventists. We still have all the same beliefs. So that's really the the woman aspect of the church, rather than the administrative acts aspect of the church. And that's why we're still uh, giving. I don't. 
I don't think we do because if they really believed what 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 we we claim claim to believe, and I know we fall short too, then why aren't they applying it? Well, yeah, they're not. Like, like to me, they're they're allied with with the world, with the papacy, with apostate Protestantism, with the woke movement, and right. I don't so want to even continue with this. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, so that would be the administration. That's that's the organization. But the, the beliefs of Adventism are what Adventism has always uh, professed to hold to. You know, the belief in the spirit of prophecy, the belief in the 2300 days, all of those things. So, yeah, obviously the administration is divided over these issues. Um, but even the ones who seem to support them aren't aren't addressing the problems in the church correctly. They're, they're doing more um, diplomacy than actually uh, getting rid of the Babylonian garment and and the all those other things that uh, Aiken has brought into the camp. So the church can't be blessed because of it. But that's why there's this message, right? So we have a message that's being given to answer to these nations that are conquering God's people, right? And these nations then represent these messages. And, and then the judges represent this counter message. And in this case, with this this message, it's a type of idolatry that's going on. And the message that's being given is a return to the old past, the 2520. And, and remember, we had Othniel was this Holy Spirit representing this work that needs to be done of seeing our own sins. And now we're, we're in, in doing that, God can then give us this light, which is the 2520. And, and that light's going to lead to this key that's going to be given to us to see uh, the relationship, the place or the role of the church and the place and the role of this message in, in response to the church, that this is a message that is going to reform individuals but not reform the church itself. The church is not going to be... Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, I know Conrad Vine tried. I mean, I, I, I very, very rare, rarely look at what's going on in the mainstream church, but I know he tried and look at look at what happened to him. Yeah, I don't Derided, know. Derided, refused. Yeah. Who you He's, yeah, he really got Who's some vile response from the GC, so that speaks volumes to me. Who, who are you talking about? Conrad Vine. I have no idea who that is. Never heard the name. Oh, I'll have to send you some of his stuff then. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that. But yeah, to try to give a message to the administration of the church is the mistake tried. people do. Because because you're not going to, according to this message, according to what we see in the judges, where that message is never going to be accepted. That the work is for the individual. Amen. We labor for Always the, has been. Well, yeah, and but the church usurped that place because they made made themselves a king. Any more thoughts on that, Dwight, or anyone else on what we're looking at here? Well. <clears throat> Looking at this, you know, on, as the administration, I have to agree. So we have Ahud escaped while they tarried and passed beyond the graven images and escaped into Sirath. And it came to pass when he was come that he blew a trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim. And the children of Israel went down with him from the mount, and he before them. So, was this a trumpet of assembly? Was this a trumpet of war? What, I mean, are we looking at this as a message that the movement becomes then unified 
to begin to give a message. Yeah. So, and I would say that once you get to this part, this is actually continuing to move into the future. And as I said, you have a message start, that message continues, but other messages will be added to it. Right. So, so when they sm escape from smooth to roughness, smoothness to roughness, um, to me, blowing the trumpet in Mount Ephraim would be the message of July 18th. Okay. I mean, because one is that's the message of the trumpets. That's, that's uh, Revelation 8 and 9. And so this is going to bring us to, to the end, but it's illustrating starting at a certain period of time in our history. So in other words, what we have here is we have two periods of seven years. We're going from 2005 to 2012, and yeah. then we're going from 2012 to 2019. Yeah. We're blowing a trumpet. The movement is then blowing a trumpet in the mount in the mountain of Ephraim. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the warning that was given to the United States. Right. So the mountain of Ephraim is representing the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Numbers 10 has messages on, uh, on, on the meanings of the trumpets. But where it says here that, and the children of Israel went down with him from the mount, and he before them. Does this not signify some kind of unity? Yeah. Which we did have in giving that message. Right. Okay. And he said unto them, follow after me, for the Lord hath delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. And they went down after him and took the fords of Jordan toward Moab and suffered not a man to pass over. So the church is being represented symbolically by the king of Moab. Mm -hmm. And the Moabites are then being delivered into the hand of the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. Now, when they took the fords of Jordan, what does this represent? Okay, so the fords of Jordan are where they're going to cross. That's where they crossed into the promised land, um, of course, right? Now we have, they're, they're taking these, so they're controlling these fords so that people just can't pass over. So the question is, what would those fords of Jordan represent symbolically? Right. I mean, waters are people. Well, waters are people, but not all the time. Okay. And, and here, these fords are not so much waters. It's, it's a passing point. It's, it's, it's some some truth that's being understood by the movement that in order for them to pass over that person would have to to understand this truth all right could, could the fords of jordan represent our understanding of millerite history that that if that no man can really understand Adventism until they understand Millerite history. 
And we've come to understand Millerite history in the unsealing of the Seven Thunders. So we have a greater understanding of Millerite history and of 457 BC and of the prophetic periods and all these things than, than Adventism does. And in order to maintain the belief in Adventism, the only way that that can be done under what's going to happen uh, is for people to, to understand these truths. We, in a sense, control the Fords, not right. as individuals, but this movement as a message. And, and that message then, by controlling that, we can then, uh, we're not going to kill anybody. But symbolically, this is the death of Moab, 10,000 men that will not escape. And then it says, so Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest four score years, which is a symbol. So this would refer to the future still, right? So this message of the 2520, it's sort of showing its history and how it addresses the king of Moab, which is in this context representing the administration of the church that is idolatrous. Well, if we if we apply Ezekiel 9 with this, mm -hmm. where it says, and they slew Moab at that time about 10,000 men, all lusty or fat, mm -hmm. and all men of valor. There escaped not a man. Could these be those that were trained in the spiritual formation that had been given a smooth message and all of a sudden it's being shown that that message that they have been giving is false? Would well, that not be? Definitely a message. I mean, I don't know. It if spiritual formation comes to play in here, other than just in a general sense, um, the church following the principles of the world, this would include lots of different things. But but I, I see your point that this is, um, I mean, this relationship to, to Ezekiel 9, um, because that's where we're leading to is this Sunday law. Well, the, the point is, as we looked at Ezekiel 9, this is to begin at the house of God. Yeah. And these that go before the house of God have a slaughtering weapon in their hand. Mm -hmm. Now, we're not looking at that literally. We're not treating it as the shepherd's rods would treat it. Exactly. We're treating it as the slaughter weapon would be the Bible alone. Mm -hmm. that this is the word of God. Yeah. And that these are slaughtered because they chose not to accept the word of God just as it reads. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at this in a symbolic method again, and they slew a Moab at that time about 10,000 men. Why 10,000? Why these that have grown fat, that have become highly respected, all men of valor. In other words, they've been out there preaching and teaching, but they're t preaching and teaching by an incorrect method. So the question that I that again remains is this interrelated with this with Ezekiel 9? Can we make that application? Well, we're gonna have ten thousand men in other places in Judges. Right. Um, so, so 
So it's obviously has some symbolic meaning. Okay. Comment from the chat says that Judges 3.29 contrasts with Daniel 11.41. Why? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say it contrasts. Um, it's it's complementary. A different class of Moabites, because I thought that at the end, uh, the Moabites or whatever you want to call them are going to join with and they'll escape from the papacy and stand up for Christ. And here the, in Judges 3.29, the Moabites are being slain. <laughs> yes, but, but here we're, they're representing different groups. Yeah. Right. So, so here Moab is representing Adventists who have accepted the world, who have accepted Moab, so to speak. But the Moabites themselves... Uh, they're going to escape out of the hand of the papacy, Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. Right. Yep. So. Class. Repeat, please. I just said two, two classes. Yeah. They might have the same name, so to speak, like I'm an SDA, but I belong to this movement, whereas you're a mainline SDA and our methods of worship and our our ideas are vastly different. Our 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 allegiances are vastly different. Definitely the allegiances, but so that's so that when you have this um, in Daniel eleven verse forty one, this is just showing you because this is in a contact context. It goes back to uh, Ezekiel. Um, 25, right? Prophecies against uh, Ammon and against Moab and Seir and against Edom and against Philistia. And, and you can see, of course, Mount Seir is connected with Moab. So, so that's why it's interesting that it has this feminine form of Seir. And I, I think part of that is a play on words. It could be as well. Uh, Seir, Seir Ath. Just, uh, but yeah, so so I don't see it as as a contrast. Is just more it's complementary. It, it's showing you the two different aspects of of the message, how it affects, because that's really dealing with the Sunday law, and that's when. See, my understanding when we look here at Judges chapter three, dealing with Ehud, is that, that we have this whole line going from we'll say 2005, up until the Sunday law, whenever that is. We don't know when that is. And the, this message where we have this, this message, our message brings us all the way to the Sunday law. But here Moab is going to be, um, in this context, the administration of the church that has gone into following the world. But we also know at the Sunday Law, the, the same symbol is being used for those that escape from the hand of the papacy, one of the groups. So I don't think it's referring there to Adventists in that context. So that's why I say it's complementary. So it's uh, using the same word, but it's, it's talking about two different things based on the context. I don't know if that's a good explanation or not. Well, it's bringing up some good points. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel and the land had rest four score years. So we have 80 years. Right. Okay. What symbol can we draw from this? <clears throat> we have a time period. We have a symbol of rest. 
we have a symbol of rest that is not tied into a jubilee. It is not tied in with the seven times. What is important about us to note that we have this land resting for four score years. Okay. I don't, I don't really have a good answer for that one. Why four score? Well, let's see. We know in, Josh, in Judges 3.11, earlier in this particular chapter, that the land had rest for 40 years and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. And the way that we've been applying this is that Othniel's 40 years was followed by Eglon's hold on the land and then 80 years became the time of rest. It's also interesting to me that in the numerical progression of the verses that we go from Judges 3.11 to Judges 3.3.0. So we have 19 verses basically in between describing mm -hmm. what was going on here. Mm -hmm. Now we're left with a single verse for consideration. And after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. Now, in Judges, we are mentioning Shamgar. What is the meaning of his father's name, Anath, and the meaning of Shamgar? If I'm looking at Strong's, it tells us that this is that Shamgar's name is an uncertain derivation. <coughs> And Anath is an answer. Yeah, well, I have Shamgar being a sword, but they don't, they're not certain about it, I guess. Now, the area of the Moabites, would that not have been to the eastern portion? of the nation of Israel and the area of the Philistines to the western portion. Yeah. So so one of the things we've noted, Stephen noted when going through the period of the judges is that you have different territories of Israel in which these, um, that's why you can't just add up the period of the judges to get, or add up all of the different uh, spans given in the book of judges to get the period of the judges. So you have, you know, here that dealing with the Moabites, they're going to have rest 80 years, but it doesn't mean that all of Israel is perfectly at rest for 80 years. Agreed. Yeah. So, so anyway, that's why now we, we're, we've moved over to uh, the western part of Israel, dealing with the Philistines. So when we're looking at this, so after Ahud was Shamgar, the sword of the answer. Judges 5, 6, part of the Song of Deborah. 
in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied and the travelers walked through byways. Now, as I looked at this, it's interesting when you, you start taking a, a hard look at the alternate readings for this particular verse. Okay, so just uh, before you go there, so, so you're gonna have in the Song of Deborah and Barak, you're gonna have this reference back to previously. Correct. Um, so it gives us a little bit more insight into Shamgar itself. But Shamgar is, is basically an answer by sword. So in this context, it would be um, a symbol of the word of God in answer to uh, what is happening. Now, when, when they talk about this, and after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. It doesn't give us much detail about that in what exactly had happened. Right. Well, it's just something that's happening over on that, in that period of time that, that this is going to be mentioned. And then in chapter four, you're going to get back to the, after Ehud is dead. Um, dealing with Sisera and so forth. Deborah. Okay, so so you have this then. It, it, and what I'm trying to do is place this into the context of our of our movement. So here you have this message of the 2520, and and its ultimate result. Let's say in to 2030 or something like that. Um, that that is is being applied. And. You know, and it says after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men. Now that word after him um, is kind of, uh, it, well, it means like behind him. So, so it can mean quite a bit, a few different things. And it can also be just a conjunction, uh, just like after that, or uh, connecting, um, so this could be something that even happens earlier before the death of of Ehud. So, which is the way that I would take this. <clears throat> um, but anyway, so you're going to have this this answer by sword, and then he's going to use an ox goad. So, an ox goad would be um, some kind of prod or something you would use to to get an ox to move. And what would the ox goad represent then as symbolically as an implement? Isn't an ox goad like a, a pointed stick? Yeah, it's a pointed stick. Yeah, they didn't have electric ones like we have nowadays. So it'd be something you... You, you, you know, sort of like a spear, but obviously not designed for war. Now, it's interesting, um, it says here in Strong's, um, Lamad, a primitive root properly to go, that is by implication to teach, a rod being an oriental incentive. So it's used often to, you know, like spare the rod, spoil the child. But that's not talking about you know whipping a child. It has to do with instruction, and um, so that would be kind of this this idea. So so here um, we have an answer by sword, and it's going to be symbolically an ox goad or a rod of instruction. And he also and he also delivered Israel. So so there's some kind of other thing that's happening in connection with this other message. But it's going to be answering to the Philistines. 
and 600 men um, are slain by this uh, judge. Now that's twice as many as Gideon had in his whole band. Yeah. So. Yeah, now, now it says in Judges 5, 6, as you noted, in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, so in both of these periods of time, the highways were unoccupied and travelers walked through byways. So, I mean, if the highways are unoccupied, right, so that means it's not safe to travel on the highways and people go through byways. That is, they have to take the securitist route to get to places. And, and when you apply the alternate readings, yeah. it would read, in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied and the walkers of paths walked through crooked ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they were not able to walk the straight path. They had to walk around. Yeah. Like you were saying, circuitously. Yeah. And and they're and and they're going to reference here uh, also Leviticus twenty six twenty two. And I'll send um, wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle, and make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate or empty. So. So this idea of the highways lying laced, waste or desolate, or empty, or unoccupied, um, that's because of the perversion of truth. And so it's not, it's not a straight way. So there's, you know, God's people are sort of wandering around in the wilderness to some degree. Right. It's kind of the point where they're wandering around in the promised land. Yeah. Because there is no straight message at that point in time. Everything that's, that's being given is not directly of God. Yeah. So then we're going to have a message that comes into this movement that it's going to occur earlier, right? Not, it doesn't, it's, it's in the time of Ehud um, that's going to be addressing this with this ox goad that 600 men are going to be slain. As you said, it's double the number of Gideon, of Gideon's army. But see, here, here's the other part. And this, is, this was interesting to me. When the translators are looking at this with the ox goat, they give reference back to 1 Samuel 17, 47. Mm -hmm. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Mm -hmm. And then we have 1 Samuel 1750. So David prevailed over the Philistines with a sling and a stone, and he smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Mm -hmm. So if there is no sword, it is not by man's effort that this situation becomes victorious. It is by the effort of God alone. Because God is directing David as to what to do. Yes, so, he couldn't use Saul's sword. Well, when it, when it came to this, when David came before Goliath, he couldn't use Saul's sword because he couldn't use Saul's armor. He went before him in dressed as he would as a shepherd. He'd taken with him smooth stones and his sling. 
Now, so he was traveling true to his calling. Right, but the, the sword that he used to cut off the head of Goliath was Goliath's own sword. Right? Yeah. So if we apply this as being, if we're looking at this from Ezekiel 9, that the slaughtering weapons are the word of God. Would the sword of Goliath be a perverted word of God? A corrupted word of God? Well, yeah. Because when we look back here, in the portion about Shamgar, 1 Samuel 13, 22 makes it very clear. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan, but with Saul and Jonathan, his son, there was found or was there found. So Saul and Jonathan alone had a spear and a sword but the people didn't because the Philistines made sure that there was no smith to be found in the land of Israel. So there was no one there that was able to explain the word of God. Okay, so another thought here. So, okay. so here we're dealing with Shamgar and his right. name, sword, and and he's going to be the son of the answer. Right, so he's going to answer by sword, and he's going to slew of the Philistines. He's going to kill six hundred men. Now, with an ox goat. Now, the word ox uh, here, um, because there are different words for ox. Mm -hmm. This one here is Bakr, um, and and it comes from the idea of of plowing. That is to make furrows. So it comes uh, twelve thirty nine, which means uh, to plow generally break forth. That is figuratively expect, it, admire, consider. So it can. Um, so if you're going to plow. Um, and, and this idea of inspect, admire, care for, consider, inquire, seek, search out. Um, and then a goad, which is this, this rod, which is teaching or correction, right? That's the, the basic idea of this word, to teach. Isn't this what we are doing with the lines? Yeah. So to me, this must represent uh, the lines, the line upon line method. And now, now Jeff did start the lines, you know, back in 1993, you know, is he, he has these reform lines. But these lines really start to develop later in this message, uh, especially in connection with the 2520. So if you look at a lot of the early presentations, whether they were on video or whether they were recorded, often there was PowerPoint being used. And uh, even when I came into the movement in 2010, everyone presented by PowerPoint, pretty much except Jeff, he actually had the whiteboards and was drawing all these different lines. Which, which I was fascinated by, by the way. Um, but that became our primary way of presenting rather than the PowerPoint. So Jeff had abandoned the PowerPoint. Now, when I first started trying to do this message, I, I created PowerPoints. Um, and I was doing it that way until I realized that drawing things on a line, one is it allowed for the Holy Spirit 
to control that study. That is, we were finding new things that we had never seen before during these, these presentations, which if you, you have a PowerPoint, I mean, you can modify them. Back then, I couldn't do it very quickly. But um, so I still use them a little bit here with these studies. But, but the main idea is that we're drawing out lines, whether we do it on a PowerPoint or on a whiteboard, rather than just putting up a bunch of text to read. Right. And, and that the light that came from this ability to draw these lines is what's going to kill these Philistines, so to speak. The double the number of the 300. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and so this is this is what's what's happened. So while we have on the one hand, Ehud and this message of the 2520, we also have just on the side um, this study of the lines that in a sense is kind of going independently of what what's happening with Ehud. So, so I, see, I think there's something to this that when we get to Deborah and Barak, um, we will start to see what's being talked about there and where that fits into our history. There's quite a bit that's going to come up in this study with Deborah and Barak. Yeah, it's going to take more than this week, I think. Well, another question that I've got, is there something that we would now see as a message with Judges 17 to 21? I mean, I know we've already covered that portion. Yeah. But were we looking at that as being a message or were we were we looking at that differently at the time that we we studied it well well we know it was relating to our message but uh, i mean you think once we get back to it once we go through all the rest of judges and come back to it i think that we can then place it within our time and understand what it's referring to but we've established that that portion should have been more like between judges two and three. Right. So the time in which it's placed is there. Right. Uh, that's when it occurs, but it's placed at the end of judges for a reason. Okay. So that's part of what we have to address, which, which we did sort of, that it's a repeat of history. Right. So, so I think that judges 17 to 21 just illustrates all the history of the judges again in a different way, a different aspect of the history of the judges. And okay. more specifically, the internal problems within the movement itself um, at this time, because I think that's how we understood it. All right. All right, so, so that's why we studied that first. Okay, uh, last comment in the chat, general conference session beginning June 6th to the 11th of this year. Yeah, so we got, and I'd commented on that earlier. Right. So the interesting thing about this is it's actually the sixth day of the third month is June 6th. So um, that is yeah, on the Jewish calendar, it's gonna be the sixth of Savan that it begins. In Samuel Snow's letter, this, that's his Pentecost letter that he wrote on June 22nd, and it's and it was republished on June 11th, and June 11th was the 11th of day of the third month, and the doubling of that gives you June 22nd, so 311, 622. Um, so it's interesting that this general conference session goes from Pentecost to the 11th day of Savan, just as Samuel Snow's third letter uh, spans. And so that period is, in, of course, inclusive of six days. It's five cardinal days. Um, 
so I think it's pretty significant. Yeah, and we, as we were saying at, at Colin's study last night, it's the sixth in Gregorian, it's the sixth month, sixth day, and it lasts six days. So you have a 666, which is pretty ominous. Six yeah. inclusive days. Yeah, so that's the chronology you're referring to in that email? There's a lot more than that. Okay. Yeah, well, you need to give me an email on what, what the chronology is so that I can look at it. Because I've been looking at this, you know, for the last couple of months, uh, looking at this, or a month at least, this general conference session. And one of the things is that Collins dependent upon Ted Wilson being reelected. Did he discuss that in the study last night? Yeah, yeah, he had this chart drawn off, but there was a lot more, more than the GCS on that. He's got a 318 double there and a whole bunch of, uh, I mean, it would take, take another hour and a half to go through it. So perhaps you could contact him and ask for his whiteboard uh, diagrams. Okay. So you don't have you, you they didn't record it because and put it up online because Colin doesn't do that. Not, yeah, not that I know of. I wish they would had because it was really exciting to me anyway. Yeah, so so there is a significance in there. But, you know, once again, Colin misapplies it. In trying to understand what's what's happening. So. So we know the chronology is correct. So I've been looking at this myself. So I have to see the rest of his chronology on that. But anyway, so that, that's sort of outside of this study here specifically, uh, what we're studying. But so, so we should start with Judges 4 then tomorrow? Yeah. OK. OK, as we're coming to the close of our time today, are there any other comments or questions? I just have a thought concerning the eight years that the Israelites are oppressed initially sure. by the king of Mesopotamia. And then you have 18 years by the king of Moab. And uh, I've just been thinking, we had these here eight years that uh, Jehoiachin was anointed when he was eight. And then he was anointed when he was 18. Yeah. So, and then if you add up the periods of time, the 40 and the 80, where they rest, you have as a total 120, which brings us, you connect to Ezra 7, verse 9, you have the 120 there. So, just some thoughts, I'm not too sure how to piece it together, but... Yeah, how, are you getting, could be, how are you getting the 120? You're taking the 8 plus the 18 plus the 80? No, he was taking the 40 years... Yeah. Plus the eighty years, the four score years. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Also, eight times eighteen is one hundred and forty. That's correct. Yes. And uh, so eighty and forty. Okay, so one twenty. Nicely done. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, shall we then close with prayer? Mm -hmm. Loving Father, we thank you for these examples from Judges 3. Help us, Father, that we may be able to consider these completely. Come to an understanding of how these are important for us today. As we go forward today, help us in our consideration so that we may more correctly present your character with all of those with whom we come in contact. Direct us now, be with us each one. I thank you for those that have attended this meeting, for those that have participated, those that will view this later. Direct us in all things to your glory. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.